Welcome to Believe in Progress, the American Association for Cancer Research Foundation's podcast. Join us as we share stories of hope and inspiration that will lift your spirits and remind you that no matter how difficult the journey may be, there's always hope. We will explore the latest breakthroughs in cancer research and hear from leading experts who are working tirelessly to find new treatments and cures in the fight against cancer. Believe in Progress isn't just about the science of cancer, it's about the human side of this disease. We'll hear from cancer survivors who have overcome incredible odds to beat cancer, thanks to the groundbreaking research and innovative treatments that are changing the landscape of cancer treatment. Join us on this journey of hope and progress. Subscribe to Believe in Progress, the AACR Foundation podcast today. Together, we can make progress in the fight against cancer and bring hope to those who need it most. Trevor Maxwell, 45, has been living with stage four colon cancer since March of 2018. He's undergone five major surgeries, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and a clinical trial. He lives in Maine with his wife and two teenage daughters. In January of 2020, my friend Trevor founded Man Up to Cancer, a purpose-driven company and support community that inspires men to connect and avoid isolation during their cancer journeys. Man Up to Cancer consists of a podcast, website, annual retreat, chemo backpack program, and a Facebook group with nearly 2,000 men impacted by cancer. Trevor has a background in newspaper journalism and has written a book, A Man's Guide to Living with Cancer. Man Up to Cancer has partnerships with CGEN, Cure, MJ Life Science, and many, many very important organizations. As a patient advisor, Trevor serves on advisory boards for CGEN, WCG Clinical, and Blue Note Therapeutics. Trevor, welcome to the AACR podcast, and thank you so much for being here today. Oh my gosh, thank you, Mitch. Like, you make me seem really important. Um, <laughs> that was a great intro. Uh, hey, I'm happy to be here with you. Always good to spend time with you, Mitch. Thank you. Well, you, you're, you're a very important guy. Uh, but before we start our discussion, I'm going to ask those of you who are listening to this episode or watching this episode on our YouTube channel to please consider subscribing to our podcast, sharing this episode with a friend, and heading over to our website, aacr.org, to consider making a donation. When you donate to the AACR, your investment in life-saving cancer research propels the important work of the more than 54,000 members of the AACR in driving progress against cancer. You can support life-saving cancer research with any donation you make today. Well, welcome again, my friend. Um, and you know, you and I have known each other now for, geez, it's gotta be two, two years, maybe three yeah. years. Um, we yep. met we met kind of virtually during the pandemic, and um, I had the good pleasure to uh, have a conversation with you. Tell me a little bit about like when you first were diagnosed with cancer. Um, you know, I've I've read the book, and and you yeah. know, there's there's a lot in there, but I'd love for people to get a little bit of background on your your cancer story. Yeah, of course. Um, two things before I dive into that. Number one, thank you, Mitch, personally and professionally with the AACR for just supporting me in my own personal cancer journey um, and, and also in supporting Man Up to Cancer as a partner. It, it has been <clears throat> a great relationship, and I'm really grateful for that. And then secondly, let me say, I wouldn't be alive today. I wouldn't be doing this show without cancer research. I'm five years, I'm almost five years into a stage four colon cancer <laughs> diagnosis, and thanks to immunotherapy, thanks to advances in surgical techniques like the, the surgeries I've had weren't even available a couple decades ago the treat the immunotherapy that I'm that saved my life wasn't available maybe even five years ago so or 10 years ago definitely so I'm just you know talking about cancer research fires me up because I'm here with my family because of that um, and I'm still in the trenches I, I still have you know um, I'm still dealing with some cancer but there's no way that I'd be here without those advances. So shout out to all the pioneers, all the folks that AACR has relationships with and supports. Um, this is real, right? Like I have two teen, my wife and I live in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. We have two teenage daughters and I was diagnosed at age 41 in 2018. They were 12 and 10. And now I have a 17 year old and a 15 year old and I'm 
um, looking at colleges with my senior in high school. And that doesn't happen without cancer research. Sarah, Sage, so, and Elise, that's your support system, Elsie, right? Yeah, yeah my, my Elsie, wife, sorry. Sarah. Um, Sage is 17 and Elsie is 15. And so. who's the singer? Who's the, the singer that does oh, the, yeah. the beautiful, um, has the beautiful voice? The singer is my 17 year old Sage. She does all the national anthems. I think she's done it for like six of the sports teams here at our town. Uh, so proud. of Amazing. Her. How important is that support system? You know, how, how important is that? I mean, uh, you know, these, these folks have been by you through thick and thin, right? Absolutely. I'm the luckiest person in the world. Like I'm, it's weird, right? You get life-threatening metastatic cancer at age 41, but I do consider myself the luckiest person because I have an amazing support system. I have an amazing family. We're going to get into Man Up to Cancer, and we're going to talk about that a lot of these, a lot of the men in our community don't have that support system. They don't have that wife who's going to stick with you through, through thick and thin. They don't have those kids at their side, like, and also the extended family and community. So it means everything to me. And then just circling on your initial question, 2018, I was just getting more tired and tired. Fatigue was my only symptom. And by the time I went in to actually get my blood work done, I was severely anemic and I had about a 10 centimeter tumor in my large intestine, um, in my colon. And that changed my life in all the ways, right? So the past five years I has been dealing with that and, and dealing with that cancer and living with it, learning how to live with it. So at the time, it was a life, I, I always use the phrase life asteroid. Like you're just going along in life, you're, you're doing your thing. You're, you're, I was really in the prime of my life. Um, and then I, I got a, a stage four diagnosis and all of a sudden everything changed. No family history, like any, any, any genetic links at all? Or? Yep, um, so I have Lynch syndrome. I did not know about Lynch syndrome until I got diagnosed. So Lynch syndrome just basically is a, it's a genetic uh, mutation. Um, so we have these genes in our body that repair cells when they do crazy things and replicate and, and turn into cancers. And for people with Lynch syndrome, those one of the one or more of those genes doesn't operate correctly. So it's basically like your spell check system in your body doesn't work. So I found out that later. And then there are some, you know, there's colorectal cancer in my family, but usually it would happen like in the 60s or 70s, like people who were older. So there was no early onset, what we call early onset or young onset colorectal cancer, CRC. There wasn't anyone in my family who had that. So, you know, I was just going to do the regular screening when I got to 50. Now it's 45 for reasons we might get into. But um, there was colorectal cancer in my family, but it was at an older age. So I definitely didn't have any reason to have it on my radar. So early on, um, it was some pretty tough times for you. Uh, I mean, you talked a little bit in the book about uh, being depressed and uh, just really kind of down in the dumps. And that's not the guy I know uh, or the guy I've, I've met. But um, if you feel comfortable, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that, those, those tough times. Absolutely. I mean, that's the core of the message. That's the core of my message with Man Up to Cancer and the book is – just being honest about what I've gone through emotionally and what a lot of guys go through with the emotional burden of cancer and the mental health piece of it, because we need more guys to just be role models in that area and just say like, yeah, I struggled. Um, so for me personally, I, after diagnosis and learning I was stage four and going into surgeries and chemo and everything else, I went into a real mental health tailspin, anxiety, depression, um, isolation. I, in the, in the summer and fall and into the winter of 2018, you wouldn't recognize me. Right. And you, you alluded to that because I'm a outgoing person. I, I like to think I have a pretty good mindset. Um, but man, I was at rock bottom with my mental health to the point where I honestly didn't have much will to live for myself. And I think the reason that I did live and didn't just walk into the woods and disappear was because of my family. And it was, it was that bad. You know, I, I had thoughts of feeling like I have failed. I'm, I've failed my family. I, I'm ashamed. I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to leave them alone. And they're my little kids. And, and I was crushed. And so, like you said, at the outset, I've gone through all this physical stuff, all these surgeries, all this chemo, mm -hmm. and that is easy compared to the emotional burden of feeling like, you're going to pass away and, and not be there for your family. That's tough stuff. And That's tough. It was stuff. a really dark place. Yeah. You know, um, 
you, you talk about uh, Shawshank Redemption and it's in the book and, and I happen to love that movie as well. And I don't know if this is, it relates, but this get busy living, it, was that like the, was that quote the turning point here? Yeah. I mean, I, as I say in the book, it, I'll condense it real quick, but I, I was so depressed and, and to the point where I just couldn't function. And I had this really important conversation with my wife right around Christmas, 2018, where I said, I, I'm so terrified that, you know, I just can't get over this idea that my kids are going to, I'm going to die and my kids are going to remember me as sick. And she looks at me and this was the moment I'll always remember. And she looked at me, she said, Trevor, I'm not going to, I'm not worried they're going to remember you as sick. I'm worried they're going to remember you as sad. And that was the moment that, again, I tell this all the time. I couldn't snap my fingers and say, I'm better now. I'm out of my mental health pit. Like I, I see now that I, I need to be better. But it was the moment where I looked at her and I said, you know what? You're right. Because I'm not a sad person. Like that's not who I am. And it's not how I want to be remembered. So it doesn't matter if I live another year or another 40 I'm going to do everything I can to live with joy and purpose. And it's not going to happen overnight, but I'm going to do something tomorrow, today, tomorrow, the next day, every day to get back to that, to, to be that person that I, I want to be, to be the husband and the dad I want to be. And that was, like you said, that was the get busy living moment where I knew that, and I knew that I needed help. And that was a bit, that's a huge barrier for a lot of guys is to get to that point to say, I can't do this on my own. Like I'm at that place to say like, Hey, I'm in a hole and I need some hands. Why yeah. is that such a problem for us guys? So it's cause we're macho or what, what's the deal? Ego. It's how we're taught. Yeah. It's how we're raised. I think we are raised as men to feel like if a challenge comes along, you just rise to the occasion. You, you're not supposed to burden others. You're not supposed to need help. Like you're supposed to just, there's this, ethos of rugged individuality in the American culture that says, you know, for a man, you know, be tough, um, get through it. Don't talk about it. You, you can handle it. But the issue is if you look around at all the great things that have been done in mankind, whether it's building cities, uh, you know, <laughs> anything else, it's all collaborative, right? Basketball, you think of my teams, you, the teams you're on as a kid, right? You don't do those things alone. It, teamwork gets you where you want to be. And it's it just... You know, I just feel like most of us guys are taught from an early age that, you know, to be a man means that you, you shouldn't have to need help in your life. And that's a false, it's a false narrative. So you're wearing a hat and that hat says man up to cancer. Um, so this is something you're, it's very important and, and it's very special to you and it's special to me and to, to many other people out there. Tell, tell our audience a little bit about Man Up to Cancer. Um, what was the, you know, what was the, yeah. the light bulb that, what was the switch that went off for you? And, and tell us a little bit about the group, if you, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I did get help, right? I, I, and it wasn't a weakness. So to me, when I say Man Up to Cancer, what I mean is bring your toughness. Absolutely. You're going to need every ounce of that to get through the cancer journey, but you're also going to need the courage to accept help along the way. Um, and the consequences of isolating when you go through cancer, which men tend to do, are, are not good ones. You have more mental health problems. You have substance abuse and addiction. You have your, your relationships often break if you're in isolation. And here's the kicker. Men who go through cancer in isolation have worse medical outcomes. This is shown by studies. Um, by the NCI, by ACS, by there's lots of literature out there that show this. So as I got help for myself, as I start, so I started going to counseling, um, individual counseling, group counseling. I started meeting people online through Colon Town, Fight CRC, these great resources. I started connecting with others going through it and accessing the resources to say, hey, I'm struggling, I'm hurting. Can, and, and people, they want to help. There's so many resources out there that want to help people going through it. But as I got the help, I noticed this glaring gender gap. Everywhere I would go, whether it's in person or online, it's seeking support, right, for cancer. It's almost always at least three women to every one man. So 75, 80% women in these groups, in these, in, at the Dempsey Center, at these places. And that was like the trigger in my mind. It was like, 
is it possible that I'm just crazy? Like I'm the only guy out here struggling with the emotional burden of cancer and needing that help and needing that togetherness. Like what I really was seeking was community. And to see that not many men were accessing it, I was like, there, you know what? I know in the back, I know in my heart that there are guys out there struggling like me, but maybe they're not reaching out because they're ashamed or because they don't want to feel vulnerable in a co-ed community. Or, you know, right? So there's lots of barriers and maybe they just don't want to say they need help. So I said, I would like to build something specifically for the guys. Like we need a place, a resource, a community that's for men going through this where we can get together and just say as brothers. And that's why I called it the wolf pack. Everything we do in Man Up to Cancer is focused on the wolf theme. And the reason for that is wolves are social beings just like humans and they don't go it alone. They packs. always travel in packs. And, and I was so fired up. I was like, we need to be a pack for each other. Guys going through cancer because we can get isolated, right? Like you don't feel the same socially when you have cancer and all your friends don't. Um, you're looking for a place where you can just be with other guys who get it. And also having an all guy group makes it so people can come in and say, you know, I haven't shared this because it's kind of embarrassing, but I want to talk about X going on with my cancer or, man, I'm really struggling or I'm in turmoil and it's a no judgment zone. It's a place of just love and support where guys can just do that without feeling like they're exposed or feeling like they're going to be judged. So I created a community. <laughs> so Man Up to Cancer started with the Facebook group. So the core of what we do is a Facebook group called The Howling Place. We now have, I think it's right around 2000 as of today, men. These are That's cancer great. survivors, patients, and caregivers. They are from all ages, all types of cancer, from all over the world, really. We have people throughout the U.S. and Canada and in several other countries. And the common core is we share this life-changing experience. But any gender can can get be part of this too, though, right? I mean, as you say, caregivers need to be involved here as well, right? Well, these are, those are in the group itself. It's, it's men yes. or people who identify as a man. Yes. So it's a men only group. So when I say caregivers, I mean, these are men who are giving care to a spouse or a loved one with cancer. Gotcha. Got it. Um, and then what, what was the, uh, what was the catalyst for the podcast? So from the beginning, I just, you know, my background is in journalism right. um, and public relations and in communications and as a writer and, and as a communicator. So I always thought from the beginning, what could I do for this community? And part of this mission, really what I want to do is change the way men go through cancer. The old road of just getting back on the horse, not burdening others, like not getting help doesn't go down a good road. So I'm trying to create this change where men feel comfortable being part of a pack leaning on each other when they need to. So with the, with my journalism background and PR and like wanting to, I didn't just want to do a community because I wanted it to be more than that. So changing the culture requires role models and content. So with my background and content, I thought I want to do a podcast where I interview other guys going through it. So then other men out there in cancer land can just tune in and, and listen to conversations between men talking about cancer, which is actually pretty rare. You don't hear it that much. Right. Um, so I wanted to do that. And then I also wanted to do, you know, social media. Um, I have an email list, like, and then once we started getting guys in the group and sharing, I would say, Hey, I would invite them to be part of the public. Like, cause my podcast is public. The social media is public. The only thing that's private is the group itself and what happens in there stays in there. Um, but for those guys who want to be role models out there and, and help others men going through it, then they come on my show or I feature them on social media um, we, I'm now excited that I have a leadership team for Man Up to Cancer. Like, it's not just me. It's Joe Bullock has been my right-hand man this whole time. So shout out to Joe. Right. Danny Riggs, Michael Reilly, Don Helgeson. So this is our five-member leadership group. And now the snowball's going downhill, right? It's like you have more momentum on this mission. Um, and, and it's really simple. The whole idea is to in inspire and encourage men to avoid isolation, Right. And, and that's, that's what it is. That's what these guys are doing. And I'm so proud of them for stepping up. So um, I want everybody to know that I invited you to come to Philadelphia for an event and then for our foundation board of trustees meeting and I invite you to come to speak to the, to the foundation board, many cancer survivors, many scientists, part of that board. Um, but um, you know, your message was, is very inspiring. You know, what motivates you to want to come to Philadelphia to meet and talk to people? 
Well, first of all, you're a pretty convincing gentleman, um, <laughs> and I and I like uh, I like your vibe. I like what you're doing with AACR, and and I think thank you. You know, for me, out to cancer to have a relationship with you, right? A mutually beneficial where we can help each other out is just great. And the opportunity to to talk to those folks, like the scientists, decision makers, right? Influencers in that community, and to show them what I'm doing, because when I get up in the morning, like look. Outside of having my family, my wife and my kids doing this work for Man Up to Cancer, working to change the culture of how men go through cancer is the mission of my life. I feel like it's my purpose. And so having an opportunity to talk to folks at the highest level of cancer care, to talk about what men go through, um, I, it's surprising you know, when I talk to people about it, sometimes I'll get like, you know what, that, that totally makes sense, but I never thought of it. And it kind of echoes what I see in the cancer support community is that a lot of these organizations aren't, aren't stopping to think like, Hey, what about the guys? Like, why is it that guys aren't engaged? You know, I, I see photos from conferences and advocacy events and it's almost all women, you know, we should ask that question. Absolutely. We should ask that question about, about why men aren't involved and what we can do to change that. So I really am appreciative of coming to speak to you and the board and doing that. Um, it just, it, it fires me up and it gives me more motivation, right? Yeah. It motivates me to keep going with it. When I see that people like you and others understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Well, you, you motivate me and, and you m motivate many, many other people. So we really appreciate that. Can you talk a little bit about the book and tell us about the book launch? And I know that was an exciting time in December. And even when you, you came to visit us in Philly, you were just kind of finalizing it and you were really, really excited about it and, um, and love to hear more about it. And also tell our audience how they could get, get the book as well, please. Thank you very much. Um, so the book is Open Heart, Warrior Spirit, A Man's Guide to Living with Cancer. And it's only available on Amazon. Um, so all you need to do is just go on Amazon, search it up, Trevor Maxwell, or the title Open Heart, Warrior Spirit. And the genesis for the book, well, first of all, I had the window to do the book because last summer, 2022, I had another um, debulking surgery, cytoreductive surgery. It's basically where my surgeon, my amazing surgeon, Dr. Cusack at Mass General, goes in, opens up my giant zipper basically on my abdomen and takes out kind of takes out whatever cancer he can see in there wasn't, and then puts that, me back like, together. Wasn't that like I think I just see I saw you in Chicago and I think like a week later you were going to go take the trip to to Mass General for the operation. Correct. That that's what we're talking about, right? <laughs> Yep, exactly. Unreal. I met you at ASCO and then the next week I went to Mass General. Dr. Cusack has now done two of those procedures on me and um, extending my life. He's amazing. And so I recovered from that really well and my blood work looked good. And I just told my wife, I was like, look, I want to write this book. I have a book in my head that I want to get written. And the reason I want to write it, well, two reasons. Number one, and first of all, is my family, my children. I don't know what's happening. I don't know. I can't control my cancer hundred percent. I don't know what's going to happen with this over right. the next couple of years or so. Right. So I want to, <clears throat> I wanted to do this as a legacy piece to put my journey and what it meant to me and, and in one place. So, that, you know, no matter what happens with my life, that they'll always have this book and hopefully many others <laughs> to, to look at and say, you know what? My dad got knocked down. And I remember when my dad was, depressed and anxious and he couldn't function, but he got up and he did something that was really meaningful for himself and for others. And that's what I wanted to do by putting down my journey in, in the page. Secondly, it is, I've been in the trenches for almost five years, like I said, and I've, I like to think that I've learned a lot. Like I, I do have some wisdom for what I, from what I've gone through and it doesn't do me any good if I'm not sharing it. So I wanted to just put down sort of what I've been through and it's also not a memoir, like the whole book, it does go through my journey, but the whole book is about this idea of men and isolation. Why do men isolate when they go through cancer? The background on that. Why is that a problem? And then what we can do about it. And then also with my journey kind of overlaid in that and also interviews with so many people from Man Up to Cancer and beyond, like there's lots of stories in there of other people and how they cope. So I really wanted to give people some practical guidance without saying, here's my system, Here's how to do this. Here's how to beat cancer. No, no, no. That's like, that's not it. It's here's some of the things that I've learned along the way. You might be feeling this way too. 
or this is something that might help you. It's a great resource, uh, no, no doubt about it. How, how's it going? I mean, how, how are, how oh, are things going? The response has been overwhelming. Oh, I've been, great. I've been inundated. I still have correspondence that I need to get to about more than a month later. And I think as of now, we've sold close to 800 copies. And for an independently published book without a budget behind it, really, like a little bit, um, but for an independently published book on Amazon to get that kind of traction That's great. Is, is, um, is amazing. And, and it's a testament to the love and the care in the cancer community because all of the relationships that I've had in these five years since I got cancer, all these friendships, when I published that book and when I put it out on social media, people just, they showed their love and care for me by getting the book, by reading it, by sharing it, by passing it on to someone else. I had a great email the other day from someone that I've never met. He said, Hey, you don't know me, but my wife and I got your book and I'm, I was diagnosed with lung cancer about six months ago. And we're reading your book. We are, we're laughing, we're crying, we're learning. I feel like we're on the journey with you. And we just want to thank you for, for being, for being honest. I think that's, I think really that's the key to the book is just, it's really honest. It puts everything out there. And to get that email from that couple was so affirming because that's what I want. He said, it feels like we're ha just having a conversation with you. Mm. And that's what I really want. That's awesome. Well, you, you definitely are an honest broker. Um, I have a, a couple more things and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. But um, how's your health right now? What, what, what's the status of your health? How are you doing? I mean, I saw you working out. I, I see yeah. you out, you know, hiking and I love that. I, I think it's fantastic. But, but what, what's going on? Again, I'm, thank you for asking. And I'm really lucky again because with everything that I've gone through, I'm actually, right now I have a hall pass. So I had my last surgery in June. I have some lymph nodes and some little implants. So here's what happened. The disease started out in my large intestine. It spread to my liver and then it also spread throughout my abdomen, this peritoneum. And we call them implants because we take out the cancer. Dr. Cusack takes out the cancer, but then these, you know, they come back. They often come back. And when you have metastatic cancer, that's unfortunately the name of the game. Sometimes you play whack-a-mole. So in June, he took out everything he could see. And then we have areas that are, you know, like on, um, on scans, you'll hear this areas of concern or this will require further attention. Um, so I have these areas in my abdomen that we're watching. But right now, my blood work, I actually got my Signaterra blood work back um, about a month ago that showed no cancer activity. And my other blood work looks great. So I feel great. Um, I'm exercising. I feel better now than I did before cancer. And that's because, again, Dr. Wow. Cusack like, and his team, they'll tell me every time I go through a surgery, they're like, Trevor, <laughs> one of the reasons you're still here kicking and doing what you do is because you're so active. We want you to go home and just be as active as possible. Get out there, get on your bike, get hiking, get moving. We feel like this is really one of the reasons why you're still alive. And I take that to heart, obviously, not in a pressure way, but in a joyful way, in a, in a grateful way, like, oh my gosh, I'm still here five years later from this thing where there's plenty of times along the way that I didn't think I would see 2023. And that's just being honest. Yep. And that's okay. Right. I've had those thoughts, but to be here and to feel good, like I'm fired up. I got a gym pass with my daughter, Elsie, the 15 year old, and we're going to go, we're actually going later today to do another workout. Because, where are you going? Uh, there's this place called next gen right in the next town over where it's just, you go in, you do kettlebells, you do cool. um, the machines, you do different stuff. Love it. And, uh, love it. Yeah. What do you do for fun? What's like, besides all, all what we've been talking a little bit about, is there any, anything that you could uh, let us in on that, you know, you, you love to do? I mean, I'm not sure that would be safe for your uh, inaugural <laughs> podcast here, Mitch, but uh, no, I, I, we have a close group of friends nearby and we have a lot of fun with them. So we'll just go over to someone's house and just have a great time and, or, or we'll go out to dinner. It's simple stuff. Like we, Sarah and I are very, we're, we're kind of homebodies. You know, we enjoy watching, you know, the next show on HBO cause you know, we, we love just be doing that, but going out with our friends um, and also just being active, right? Like you've seen the photos when I go hiking with Sarah or, or, and friends, that is like soul food, right? That, yeah. that is just, and I'm, it's a double-edged sword because obviously I'm so grateful that I can do it and I take all the people in my community. So in Man Up to Cancer, we've lost about 130 of our members since we started who have passed away. Mm -hmm. And it's a burden on one hand, like, yes, I grieve them, but I also, 
when I, again, when I get up, I think like, what would Jared want me to do today? Right. What would Wes want me to do today? What right. would Alex want me to do today? Go live your life. Go live your life to the fullest. Cause you don't know, you just don't, nothing is given to you. So when we do that stuff, when we're out there exercising or hiking, I feel those guys in my heart. And so when I get up there on top of there, I'm like, you know what? I can't help but smile because what a gift, right? And and so I get, I'm going to go on a rant here, but I, I get so frustrated when people act like everything is such a nuisance in this world or, well, you know, I only had, they complain about the battery, battery life on their phone or something. I was like, this bogged down in like the trivial complaints. I'm like, look around people. We are, we have these bodies and we're on this planet spinning around in this infinite, whatever, like make, make use of it. Don't take it for granted. And, and look, I, I definitely did in some ways before my cancer diagnosis. I hope that by sharing this, that it doesn't take a life threatening illness to get people to, to really just appreciate every day of their life. It's this great message, um, a very important message, and not just for folks dealing with cancer. It's for everybody. Right. Everybody should hear what you just said. Um, so I'm really hoping and I'm dreaming that uh, this podcast, Believe in Pro Progress, a CR Foundation podcast, is, is really grows and, and grows. And, and if there are some men that are listening to this and hear this and need to get in touch with you or need to learn more about Man Up to Cancer, where do they go, my man? And we'll put this in notes, obviously, but love to yeah. for you to tell us where people should be going. Anybody can email me anytime. Trevor at manuptocancer.com. So that's T-R-E-V-O-R at manuptocancer.com. And then just look at the website. So if you go to manuptocancer.com, you can see the podcast. You can see, you know, the social media stuff. You can see the group itself. You can learn about the Facebook group. And you can also, um, yeah, just, just there's a video. We, had, we did a John Waller. Shout out to John Waller. Great video. He is a stage four warrior from Oregon. He is going through. He's in the trenches right now. John, we love you. He came to, and Marty Murphy set this all up. Um, from Cure last year, but John Waller came to our Gathering of Wolves retreat in New York last September. He produced a five-minute professional. He's a filmmaker. He goes and climbs mountains around the world and makes films. He produced a five-minute film about Man Up to Cancer that will give everyone the background about what we do and who we are. And if you go to manuptocancer.com, it's right there front and center. Just check out the video. That I guess that's probably the gateway, right? Check out the video, see if it resonates with you, and then um, get involved. Join the group if you want to listen to some podcasts and email me if you have any questions. Trevor Maxwell, um, you're one of the best people I know. You, I, I've been in this profession a long, long time. I have a brother that's a cancer survivor. And, um, uh, you know, you inspire me to work harder. Um, so one day my grandchildren won't have to deal with cancer the way we know yes. it today and, uh, and your daughters and, and all that. So just, you need to know that you really motivate me and you motivate so many other people. Um, keep doing what you're doing brother. Cause, cause I love it. And, and you've got a great message and I want you to keep going and I'm here to help you. You know, I've got your back and uh, we're going to continue to support you. Thank you so much for helping me with this very first podcast. Um, I was really excited and it was a no brainer for me to who would be my first guest. I said, it's, it's going to be the one and only Trevor Maxwell. I promised myself I wouldn't cry over here. Mitch, what you're doing to me, like, <laughs> Don't make me cry, please. Well, yeah, know, it it happens worth, very like, easily. Your, your um, podcast is going to be successful. I congratulate you on doing well, it. It means a lot. And, and to be here with you on the first run, Thank you. Well, we're going to need your help and, and look to you to help us, like, you know, build this audience as well. And as always, I'll be with you all the way. Um, so Absolutely. Whatever I can do, you let me know. You thank know you. That. Thank you so much. Give your family my best. I, I really want to meet those those uh, young ladies. And, and, and um, they're, they're probably really special. And it would be great for me one day to meet them. But hope you have a wonderful day. Um, and uh, we'll talk soon, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. All it's right. Take care. Uh, once again, thank you to our listeners, supporters, and donors. Remember, your support drives the progress against cancer. Once again, please consider subscribing to our podcast, sharing this episode with a friend, and heading over to our website, aacr.org. That's aacr.org to consider making a donation. Thank you for listening to Believe in Progress, the AACR Foundation podcast. Thank you all and have a great day. Thanks, Trevor.